I ask for your attention for a few moments um, as we go to the Word of God. Amen? Ready? Okay, let's pray. Father, once again, I pray in the name of your Holy Son, our Savior, our Lord, and I pray that by His Holy Spirit that you will bless this message, that you will bless us as we look at these scriptures, as we share these scriptures. I pray that your truth will become alive to us. I pray, Lord God, that our lives will be transformed. I pray, Lord God, that you will grant us repentance and everlasting life. I pray, Lord God, that you will grant us to be built up in our spirits and our souls, to be filled with the love of God, to be filled to overflowing. I pray for the reality of these spiritual things that we discuss, that we talk about, they would not be perceived as something far away or distant or that has nothing to do with my daily life. But we would recognize and realize this is true. This is true now. And I pray, Lord God, you will help us to grasp it, to feel it, to know it, Lord God, to experience it. Not just to be like Job, that he knew you with the hearing of the ear, but later he saw you with the seeing of his eye. Lord God, let your word be something we not only have heard, but something that we perceive and feel and experience. Lord, let us gaze upon your glory today. Lord, let us truly see you high and lifted up like Isaiah did when he went into the temple, sitting on your throne in glory and splendor and majesty and absolute holiness. So Lord, I pray that your spirit will teach us We need the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to teach us, to reveal to us these things that we read on paper, but unless you speak them to our hearts, it has no impact on our lives. So cause your word to be a living word today, Lord God. Write it on the tablets of our hearts, Lord God. Lord, let these scriptures, let these verses, let these truths, let them be branded upon our hearts. Let them be burned within our souls. Let them be things that we feel, we hear and see and feel and experience and let our lives literally be changed as a result of your powerful, powerful word. Help us, Lord God that we would not gather together to worship an absentee God, that we would not gather together to worship a God who's not here or a God who is so far away. But Lord, I pray that you will draw near to us as we draw near to you. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Thessalonians 1, chapter 1, verse 5. Paul writes, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Now, I want us to back up one verse to verse four. Listen to this. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election By God. What does it mean to be elected? It means to be chosen. He knew they were chosen by God. How did he know they were chosen by God? He says, for our gospel, our message about the Lord Jesus Christ, it did not come to you in word only. Did it come in word? Yes, it came in word. There was a message. There were there were principles. There were truths. There were things. There were scriptures. There was a message. It was words. He used words to communicate this message. But notice he puts the emphasis on that it did not come to you in word only. It didn't come in word only. It did come in word. There were words, many words, true words, profound words, theological words. Yes, but that's not all. It didn't come in word only. This is how we know you were chosen by God, friends. This is how we know that you are the elect of God. This is how we know that you are the saved. This is how we know you're children of God. How? Because we heard the gospel? No. Many people hear the gospel and are not the children of God. Many people hear the gospel and they are not chosen by God. Many people have heard the gospel from the time they're a child to the time they're an adult and they are not God's children. So how do you know the difference? What's the difference? The difference is this. When the word came to you, it did not come in word only. It came in power. Power, supernatural, life-changing power. It came with force. It came with authority. It challenged the idols of the heart. It challenged the strongholds in the mind. It challenged the entire direction of your life. And it said, turn or die. Why will you go on in your sin? Turn, the word came and confronted us with reality, with truth, with eternity, with the judgment of God. 
and the reality of our sins and the severity of God's judgments and the truth of his love and mercy and redemption through the blood on the cross that was shed to wash away our sins. It didn't come in word only. How many people, they know the word, but only in word. They know the scripture, but only in word. They know about Jesus, but only by the hearing of the ear. They have no actual experience of these truths. They have no revelation in their souls. They have no real encounter with God. They're so they're, they can live in their sin and just kind of on the surface, show sure, Tom and the like just kind of, uh, just kind of uh, perfect the, the life on the surface, but the inner core, the uh, the inner heart is absolutely the same. The top, begitu, it's the same, unchanged. How many people they will be? Oh, I'm a Buddhist. I go to church. Okay, I'm an atheist. I go to church. They go to church. They accept a new system of thought. We used to be a Buddhist, but now we're a Jesus person. They accept what the Bible says is true. But the reality is, they have never met God. They don't know God. They heard the word, and it was right. What they heard was correct, but it came in word only. There was no power. There was no, I want to tell you, if you really hear the word of God, it will come with a confrontation. Confrontation. It's impossible for God to speak to humanity and there not to be a direct confrontation. Why? Because we are rebels from birth. We are dead in sins and transgressions. We are doing our own thing, living our own way. Everyone everyone has gone astray. There is none righteous, not one. It's impossible for God to speak and not to address the condition and not to address the reality and not to to expose and not to rebuke and not to correct and to bring us out of darkness and into light. And this is something that is violent. This is something that is a great struggle. This is something that is very intense. It is, very, it is, it is something that is very powerful. That's why Paul uses the word power. When the gospel came, when he preached the gospel to them, he knew, I knew, these are the children of God. How did he know they were the children of God? Because they grew up in church. That doesn't make you a child of God. How did he know? Because he saw what happened when they heard the message. It came with power and in the Holy Spirit. He saw them weeping over their sins. He saw them kneeling down and confessing. He saw them, their lives changed, their faces glowing. He saw that they used to worship some idol over here or they used to say that Caesar is Lord and now they're boldly and publicly saying, no, Jesus is Lord. There's been something that happened. There's been a transformation. Our gospel did not come to you in word only. It did come in word. We never want to neglect that. There's always a message. There's always a truth that needs to be proclaimed. But you can know the Bible inside out. There's been atheists that memorize the entire Bible. They're atheists. They know the entire Bible by memory. Ben was telling me about a Muslim that memorized the entire Bible. I don't know if it was the Old Testament or New Testament, both, uh, or what part, but he memorized the Bible but he's a Muslim, and he rejects Christianity. He memorized it so he can refute Christianity. He knows the whole thing. He knows the Word of God by memory, but it has no impact over his soul, no impact over his life. The Word has come to him. He memorized the whole thing, but in word only. But Paul knew these Thessalonians, he knew they were chosen by God. How did he know? When the gospel came to him, God's power was manifested in their lives. They were convicted. They were convinced. They were repentant. They were believing. And they bore good fruit. That's how you know. Without that, probably not. Probably not. Modern Christianity has lost this. A form of Christianity, a form of Christianity has been preached in the last few several hundred or to two hundred years that is totally, almost totally devoid of the power of God. 
unless you're in a very charismatic circle, they talk a lot about the power, but it's very different from what I'm talking about right now. It's often only focused on manifestations, some sort of a special miracle, turning water into wine, or weird things like that. I mean, I'm not saying God doesn't do it. He, Jesus did turn water into wine. But a lot of the stuff in these so-called charismatic churches, I'm sorry to say, is very similar to dukun. Witchcraft. When I'm talking about the power of God, I'm not talking about it in that way. But a message that comes with divine authority and power to penetrate hard hearts. I've seen many churches, many uh, services, where there was many miracles, supposed miracles that took place. Maybe they were leg, was, now they can walk. Okay, I've seen many of those sort of things. But I usually see the lives are not changed. We're talking about a power that literally completely transformed idolaters to being radical disciples of Jesus Christ. To the point that they now suffer persecution for their faith. And they're new believers. When Paul wrote this, I don't know how long after it was that he had been there, but it wasn't very long. How long was he there? I can't remember, just a few weeks, I think, before he got thrown out from persecution. How long were they separated? I think it was a few months before he wrote this letter. These guys are probably not even Christians for a year. So how can they be like so serious about God? Because the word did not come to them. The, message, the gospel did not come to them in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Nowadays, people are taught that if you just agree with this message, point one, point two, point three, and point four, if you just agree with point one, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Point two, uh, I forget, like the four spiritual laws, what, what they have on there, the Romans road or something like that. Um, whatever. If you just agree with this, they say, that's it. Okay. Congratulations. You're a Christian now. I say that's absolute hogwash, nonsense. It's not true. And it has created more false converts, more false Christians than probably any other doctrine in the history of the church. When the gospel comes in reality, it comes in power. You know, I heard the gospel from the time I was a child but I wasn't saved. I believed it was true, but I wasn't saved. I mean, the Bible says even the demons believe and tremble. The, the, the demons believe the Bible more than you and I do, and the demons are not saved. Oh, I thought you just had to believe that it's true. No, the devil believes that it's true, and he's not saved. So what does it really take? Well, it takes a radical repentance. In other words, you have to die to self, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. You have to turn from your sinful, worldly ways. And f Listen, if you grew up in church, if you grew up a Christian family, it's the same for you as it is for a Buddhist, an atheist, or any other religion. Growing up in the church, the only difference it makes is you have access to the information early on. But it doesn't change the fact that you were born in sin, you're a rebel against God, you're self-righteous, self-willed, uh, uh, and, 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 and rebellion to God. And if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, it's not going to be because you go to church every Sunday. It's going to be because you turn from sin and turn to Jesus Christ. That's going to be the only way you get in. But you sometimes, when you grow up in church, it's worse because people have heard this message their whole life and they think they already accepted it. They think they already believed it, but the reality is they know the gospel, but only in word, in word only. They've never heard the gospel in power. They've never been 
thoroughly dealt with and convicted and rebuked by God to a point where they will turn from their sin and they will trust in Jesus Christ. So we see here through Paul's letter to the, to the Thessalonians that the gospel is supposed to be a message with a divine authentication. What I mean is this. When the gospel is preached, it's not only supposed to be proclaimed by a man. It's supposed to be proclaimed by a man, that's true. But there's supposed to be another voice within the voice, the voice of the Spirit of God. That's why Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem until what? Until they receive power from on high. Why? Because if they went out previously, if they went out prematurely, if they went out before they had received the power of the Holy Spirit, they would be preaching the gospel but in word only. And what would be the result? There will be no result. There will be no supernatural result. There will be no lives radically transformed. There may be some people impacted because people are influenced by words and concepts but it will not be the type of impact that changes somebody's heart radically. It will not be the type of impact that changes somebody dramatically. It will not be the, the sort of impact that changes somebody's heart. Only the Spirit of God can change someone's heart. So they were commanded to wait. Did they know the gospel? Yes. Didn't they know Jesus had died and risen from the dead? Yes. They knew all of these things. They knew all of these facts. They heard all of his teaching. They saw all of his miracles. They could have gone straight out and say, we're going to tell everybody what happened. But why did Jesus insist they don't go? Let's think about it like this. Jesus already died on the cross for the sins of the world. And the people of the world are dying in their sins every day. If they don't go out there and tell them now, how will they ever hear? They will not hear. But Jesus purposely made them wait. Can you imagine some of them must have felt like, but we have to go now. My grandma, my mother, my brother, my father, my relatives, this other country, they don't know the truth, they don't know the word. But Jesus said, don't go, wait. The how will they be saved? They won't. That's my problem, not yours, but you must wait. How could this be? How could it be so crucial that they have to neglect the responsibility to preach the gospel, to wait for this promise of the Father? Because of this, if they go out in their own power, in their own strength, the gospel will not change lives. And souls will not be saved. Listen, the gospel is not just a message, an intellectual message, a system of thought, a system of theology. It's a message with supernatural power. That's why they were told, no, don't go yet. Why? Wait. I'm going to give you something more so that when you go out and speak, it won't just be you speaking. But you will speak and you must speak but as you speak, I will speak. That's the power. That's the power. That's why Paul says, My gospel didn't, our gospel didn't come to you in word only. It was more than words. Nowadays, you could almost go to any Bible school or seminary and you could learn 
a million words, thousands of words, and that's all you'll learn. That's all you'll learn. Clever theological systems. You won't have a class on the power of God. You won't have a class on being clothed with power from on high. You won't have it. You may have a class about the Holy Spirit that talks about theologically about the Holy Spirit, but there will be no emphasis, almost no emphasis, on the reality that the gospel was never meant to be preached in word only. We don't deny it must be preached in words, of course, but that is not enough. If it wasn't enough for the apostles, then how about for us? We have reduced Christianity to a bunch of utter nonsense in our generation. It's just one level above being atheists because you devoid everything of the power, you devoid everything of the experience, you devoid everything of the reality, and you put everything in an intellectual system. And as long as you agree with one, two, and three, everything's okay. Do this step, step one, step two. That is not biblical Christianity. That is not historical Christianity. Historical Christianity, not only in the days of the apostles, but true Christianity has always been a religion with power. Supernatural power. John the Baptist, think of this. John the Baptist did no miracles. John the Baptist didn't do any miracles. But all of Israel went out to hear him preach. The whole nation was shaken. The whole nation were on their knees repenting. He did no miracles, no signs, no wonders. His life was the miracle, and his preaching was filled. The Bible says he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. You have to understand that. He's not just a man with words. He's a man with power from on high. Do you understand that Jesus did nothing in his earthly ministry until at his baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And then later he said, the spirit, of the, I, the spirit of the Lord is upon me that I might preach the good news and heal the blind and the lame, etc. How was he doing that? How was he able to do it? Where was the power coming from? Not from his deity, but from the Spirit of God that came upon him. This is true Christianity. It's always been like that. That's why we cannot accept, we'll never accept intellectual assent to certain things as being a true conversion. What do I mean? I mean this. You can say a prayer. Uh, it's very popular in the West. We call it the sinner's prayer. Ren zui dao gao. Say the prayer and everything is okay. You know, before I knew better, I said that prayer with hundreds of people, and I don't think any of them were saved. How would you know if they're saved? Are you judging them? No, I'm just using common sense, okay? How did Paul know the Thessalonians were saved? Because he saw the gospel didn't come to them in word only, but in power. He saw their lives were changed. He knew this is now a Christian. It wasn't because they raised their hand or said a prayer. He saw power. He saw manifestation. He saw repentance. He saw a changed life. He saw a, a new creation. Power manifested and changed a life. They were once slaves of drink, slaves of drugs, slaves of every sort of sexual immoral thing. They were slaves of worshiping idols and the love of money. But now he sees they are holy and they are chaste, and they are fearing God, and they are staying far away from the idol temples. That's what the power of God was manifested in the preaching of the word. It wasn't Paul's eloquence. It wasn't his much learning. And I want to say this. I think you probably see where I'm headed with this or what I'm trying to emphasize with this. All true Christian ministry, all true, note the word true, I didn't say all Christian ministry. There's a lot of ministry that goes on today that I would not consider true Christian ministry. But all true Christian ministry is supernatural by nature. 
What do I mean? I don't mean that the, the, the pastors must like levitate up into the pulpit and they, they grow wings and fly away after they're done preaching like all these. No, I don't mean like supernatural like that. I mean there is a power, a weightiness. There is something that takes place when the word is preached. Listen, it's not only about preaching. All ministry, real ministry is supernatural. And if it's not supernatural, I don't consider it true Christian ministry. Not the type that will leave an eternal impact on a soul. It's not the type that will leave a deep impression on the soul. For that, it must be the Spirit of God. Without that, it'll go in one ear and out the other. Now, Paul says here in verse 4, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, he knows they're chosen by God, he knows they're children of God, he knows they're saved. How does he know it? For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. So Paul knew they were saved because of what happened when he went there and when he preached the gospel, how they responded to it and what took place in their lives. But look, let's look at another verse in chapter 2 of uh, Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Okay, I want us to ask a question here. So Paul went to them. They didn't know Paul. They didn't know Jesus. They didn't know anything about Christianity. They didn't know any of these things. They did not study the Bible. They probably never seen the Old Testament in their whole lives. Never heard this. Never talked to nobody. They just, they'd have no idea. Complete blank. Zero. Nothing. And Paul goes there with this message about a king who was crucified on a cross and risen from the dead and commands all men everywhere to repent and believe so they can be forgiven and receive eternal life and that they should keep his commandments and walk in his ways. He comes preaching a message like that. Okay, but how did they respond to it? He says, when you, receive, you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. Listen, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. I, have, I ask a question to you. How did they know? How did they know? How could they possibly know that it was not the word of men? Did they go back and study the Old Testament? They had no Old Testament to study. Could they go back to Jerusalem and check all the facts? It was impossible. Could they Google it? Impossible. There was no way they could go and do all the research to determine if all these Bible verses and Old Testament Israel and all that and what happened with Jesus of Nazareth, there's no way they could know through those means if this was the word of man or the word of God. So I ask you, how in the world could they possibly know this was the word of God? I tell you, only one way. Because as Paul spoke those words, there was someone else there speaking with him. As Paul gave testimony to these facts, to the things that he had come to understand, he didn't, remember, he was not an eyewitness. He did not see Jesus crucified or risen from the dead. Jesus appeared to Paul after, but he preached those facts. Jesus had appeared to him, but he didn't see the crucifixion and the resurrection. So he's also, Paul's witnessing the things that he didn't see with his own eyes. He saw Jesus, but not those things. The other apostles saw all those things. Here's Paul preaching those facts that he didn't even see with his own eyes. So it's lacking that element of firsthand witness. My question is, how could they possibly know it was true? To the point, they gave up the idols they had worshipped for generations and generations and generations. All of their ancestors, as far as they could remember, worshipped these idols, lived this life, and they gave it all up 
They cut it all off. They turned from it. They put all of their hope and all of their faith and all of their trust in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ alone. How could they know? I tell you how they knew. Because Paul's gospel did not come in word only, but in power. Not the power of eloquence, not the power of much learning, so you have much information and much knowledge. No, a power that surpasses all of that. It was a, the power of God. Divine, supernatural, invisible, penetrating power that got into their hearts. It got into their souls. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Paul, I don't know how he preached. Did he yell? Was he quiet? I don't know. It doesn't matter. But whatever, however he preached, when he preached, there was someone else that preached alongside him. And that's why his preaching was effective. I, I read Charles Spurgeon tell a story of a woman he met that had been over to America because Charles Spurgeon was in England and a woman had gone over to America and that was the time when Charles Finney was an American evangelist was being mightily used of God in revival. God was moving powerfully when he preached. So this woman went and she had an opportunity to hear Charles Finney preach and she came and reported to Spurgeon the experience and she said, when I got there to hear him preach, she said, I was extremely disappointed. His preaching was so dry. You don't expect that, do you? From a powerful, mighty evangelist. She said it was very dry. It was very, it felt just so boring. Like there was nothing happening. But she said as she listened and listened and listened, all of a sudden, all that dryness, all of the, the words, the, he, I don't think he preached loud. I don't think he was yelling. He was very logical, very precise, like a surgeon. And eventually, all, all that she heard got inside of her and exploded with fire. Pierced to the heart. Listen, it wasn't his eloquence. It wasn't his presentation. It wasn't anything like that. According to that, it was a boring sermon. But there was something more that was happening while he preached. And that's why he had the results that he had. God's spirit was bearing witness to the hearer's spirits so they could say and know this is God. This is truth. Not only that, it's not enough to recognize as God. Do you know the Pharisees recognized that Jesus was from God? But they refused to acknowledge him because they loved the praise of men. It's got to go beyond saying this is of God. Nicodemus went to Jesus at night and said, we all know that you're from God. Remember that? They saw the miracles. They were convinced it was from God. But listen, we're talking about a gospel that goes deeper than that. It's a gospel that searches out sin. It's a gospel that exposes our hypocrisy, exposes the lies that we live in, exposes the bondage and the judgment that we're under. And points the way forward and says, repent and believe the good news and you will be saved. So, Paul knew they were saved because when he preached, God's power manifested in their lives. Is that clear? They knew Paul was speaking the truth because as he spoke the words, someone else was present that could not be explained away and could not be denied. One time I preached in a school in San Antonio, Texas. It was the second day I preached there. They didn't know me the first time they had me, and then they invited me to come back. The second day when I was preaching, I was pre it was young people, and um, one of the students apparently, I found out later, one of the students fell asleep <laughs> while I was preaching. You don't like to hear that. I don't want people, hey, wake up, everybody. You know, no. But somebody fell asleep while I was preaching, and... Uh, and later, one of the teachers told me, and yeah, and she said she had a dream, and in the dream, you were right there preaching at her. <laughs> it wasn't just me speaking. Someone else 
speaking. Even though she fell asleep, God is in her face. Hey, wake up. And there I was in her dream. I pray that I'm in all of your dreams tonight preaching to you. <laughs> okay. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want us to see that this is clearly Paul's entire outlook on ministry and preaching. This is Paul's true perspective. We're not just going to look at one verse in Thessalonians. Those two verses are already enough, but we can take it much, much further than that. Paul shares us the secret of true gospel ministry. Now, when I say gospel ministry, usually it's referring to preaching, but I want us to understand that it extends beyond that. Listen, if you are a mother at home, um, how do you say that? Raising children. You need the power of God to lead them to God. It's not enough to just be strict with them and teach them the Bible. It's not enough. It's important. You must do that. Of course, the message comes in word. But you need more than that. You need God's spirit. You need God's power. And listen, it's not automatically so. And we'll probably have to go into that another time. Everybody, it's very popular nowadays to say, to teach, that everybody, every true Christian has the Holy Spirit. Is it true? Yes, you could say it's true, but it's not totally true. What do I mean? I mean this. If it's true that we have all received the same thing that the apostles and the early church received in the book of Acts, then why are their lives so dramatically different from ours? Why is the power that they experience so much greater, so much more intense than what we experience? If we've all received the same thing, we've all received the Holy Spirit, right? This is, I believe, one of those false teachings that it goes under the radar because there's enough truth in it that it can go undetected. Yes, are you truly born again? Then the Spirit of God is in you? I won't deny that. But in the book of Acts, we see very clearly that there was people that needed something more. They were already repentant. They'd already believed. They were even baptized in water. But the apostles, the apostles had to go down from Jerusalem, lay hands on them, and then something happened. They received power. And that was the promise. So here in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And I, brethren when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. So Paul did not come with much eloquence with all of his learning. Was he a learned man? Yes, he was. But he did not use that as his means to influence the people. Do you understand that many people, many preachers nowadays, the way they influence the congregation is by displaying their vast learning. They know philosophy, they know art, they know politics, they know theology, they know everything, and when they stand in the pulpit, they display all of their knowledge. I want to tell you one thing, that is not the gospel, and that is not the power of God, and that is not God's way to win sinners. You might win people to your church, but you will not win them to Christ. They will not know Christ through much learning, through much knowledge. And Paul knew this, and therefore he shunned away from that. He shied away from it. Paul knew a lot. He was a very educated man, but he purposely did not use that because he did not want people to be influenced by his learning and his intellect and all of his knowledge. So when I came, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, now, Paul maybe was a good speaker, and he, he says, he, his critic says that he wasn't. But maybe that's not because he was not potentially a good speaker. Maybe he purposely spoke very simply. Maybe he very purposely left all of his highfalutin vo vocabulary at home. And when he came to preach God's word, he used very simple words, very simple illustrations. I mean, Paul's not always simple. Some of the verses he wrote are very hard to understand, okay? Even Peter admitted that. Um, but anyway, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. But listen, he did come with the testimony of God. We must not neglect that reality. When Paul went there, he had something to say. It wasn't just that he showed up and he just said, like in some 
uh, charismatic churches, Holy Spirit, come. And then they just sit down and just all this stuff starts happening. And that's not how the gospel is preached in the New Testament. That's not it. There is a message that must be proclaimed. There is a word that must be taught. But it's also not like this other side of, in, of these pseudo-intellectual theolog theological types. They think that just with logic, they think that just with clear thinking, they think that they can win souls. Totally false. It's not true. It's not enough. So he, Paul purposely shied away from um, excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. But he did come with the testimony. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now this is an interesting verse. What's the weakest thing about Christianity from the worldly perspective? The fact that our Savior died on a cross. That's the weakest thing. That's, for the Jews, it's like blasphemy. For the Gentiles, it's, it's foolishness. And so Paul stuck on that point because he's not going to convince anybody like some people like to do evangelism today. They try to persuade somebody, oh, if you just become a Christian, you'll have a better life and you'll have peace and you'll have joy. What is that? It's nonsense is what it is. It's not really evangelizing. It's, it's using human persuasion rather than the gospel message itself and God's power to try to influence people. So I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. But here's the key. This is the key to Paul's entire ministry. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. This is what's been handed down to us as the essence of true Christianity. It's a message with power. It's not only power and it's not only a message. It's a message with power. If it's only power, it's chaos. It's, there's no... There's no boundaries to it. It can go into every sort of weird, foolish, even demonic things. And many churches today that don't properly preach the word, but they have a hunger for God. And I believe they do hunger for God, but they don't know the word and they don't preach the word properly. When they meet together, it's absolute chaos. And every sort of weird thing that you can imagine... I. Sorry to pick on the Philippines. I think I said this one time, but when I was in the Philippines many, many years ago, there, we stayed on the University of the Philippines campus, and um, there was a church that rented their hall there. I don't know what the name of the church, I don't know what sort of a church it was, but I know this. All you heard when you walked by was these loud screamings and groanings. and wah, wah. So what they were doing is they were just being there all Sunday afternoon just casting out demons of everybody, I guess. I guess that every Sunday they had a lot of demons. I mean, I don't know where they got so many demons. I mean, listen, I believe in casting out demons. I've cast out demons. But I'm saying it's not normal that everybody in church has a demon. You have to cast out demons every, all day long, Sunday, and they're, they're crying and crying. Ooh, 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 ah, ooh, ooh, ah. I mean, to me, that's just weird. They don't have a proper teaching of the Word of God. Listen, people can cry, okay? People can have demons. Oh, I believe all this, but I'm just saying that when there's no proper teaching of the Word of God, people often go into very weird things, but they're hungry for something. They want to experience anything, something. But here's the thing. They don't know how to tell the difference between good and evil, light and darkness. Why? Because they've gone away from this Word. They've gone away from the message. They've gone away from the truth. You understand that? That is not what we're talking about. But the type of Christianity that so much nowadays passes for orthodoxy, so way to Zheng Tong, is not Zheng Tong. The, the so-called orthodoxy of today is not true Christianity. 
I'm convinced of that. The things that most, most, I don't say all, most of the seminaries and Bible schools of today are producing is not biblical Christianity. I don't say their doctrine is wrong. I say their emphasis is wrong. The focus is on logic, intellect, convincing speech, proper doctrine, theory, the way that you do things, etc. In fact, you won't find this in the Bible. You don't find anywhere that Jesus taught this. But when I was in Bible school, I actually never took the class, but one of the most popular classes was a class called homiletics. Do you know what homiletics is? It's where they teach you how to speak. They teach you how to be a they teach you how to preach. That's not in the Bible. If it's so important in every seminary you have to take that, every Bible school but you have to take that class, how come it's not in the Bible? Because the emphasis has shifted. Our concern is with presentation. Our concern is with eloquence. Our concern is with, with perfect logic. Our concern is, is, is with superficial things. The biblical concern is with two things. Listen, truth and power. It doesn't, listen, truth can be presented in many packages. In other words, it can be very smooth and nice, and it can be very rough. What did John the Baptist come like? Remember how he dressed? He was a rough man. He was like a mountain. We would say he's a caveman. He's a mountain man. John the Baptist, he's wearing like camel skins and he eats wild locusts and honey. And he yells, he yells at uh, Herod, repent, you know, you shouldn't have that woman, etc. This is a rough man. And he preached truth and God honored him. And Jesus came along. See, John didn't drink. He didn't even eat. He fasted all the time. But Jesus comes along. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. The presentation was different. They were both from God. And they both spoke truth. The point is there must be truth. But there must be power. Divine power. Supernatural power. If not, you can be very convinced by all of the intellectual arguments for Christianity. There's a lot of them. It's called um, apologetics. Like why Christianity is true and why the other religions are false. There's a lot of information about these topics. It's true. But it won't genuinely convert a soul from sin to God. For that, there must be power. Now, with Paul, let's go one step further. He shares his personal experience here. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. If Paul, a man like Paul, a man that wrote so much of the New Testament, were to say such a thing like that, do you not think that must be very important for us today? Of course. Let's look at uh, chapter 3. Verse 5. Now he's talking about him and another minister of the gospel, Apollos. Verse 5 through 7. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered. But listen to this. But God gave the increase. He's talking about their gospel ministry to the Corinthians. Paul went there and preached, and they got saved. Because he did not preach with human eloquence or wisdom, but with simplicity of speech, Christ crucified, and with a demonstration of the Spirit and power. Where did the demonstration of the Spirit come from? Did Paul produce it? Where did the power come from? Was that something that belonged to Paul? No, 
It's God's spirit and God's power. All Paul could do was the speaking. God had to do the rest. So here, he gives an illustration that I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So when I planted the seed, God blessed it and you guys got saved. Apollos came along and taught you more and you grew spiritually. In the first instance, who caused the people to be saved? God, by his spirit and his power. In the second instance, who caused the people to truly and genuinely grow spiritually? Not Apollos. He was an eloquent man. He knew the word very well. But Paul says it was not his eloquence. It was not his learning. If you grew as a result of Apollos' ministry, if there were spiritual transformations that took place in your life, Apollos cannot take the credit for it. Why? Because I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. In other words, the blessing that was there was the result of God's supernatural presence, God honoring his word, God blessing his word, God causing his word to be fruitful and to multiply. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. There's a lot more on this topic that I could share about, but I think I'm going to wrap it up for today. But once again, I want to make the comparison between the church in the New Testament and the church of today. And I believe that the greatest difference is the church of the New Testament was supernatural. I don't mean they always walked on water or they always did miracles. That's not, I, don't, I believe that those happened, but I'm, but I'm saying that it wasn't just them gathering together, but God was there with them. Even the pagans were afraid in many cases. In Jerusalem, after the Holy Spirit um, came on the day of Pentecost and the revival was, uh, broke out, the, the common people that they didn't believe you, they were, they were afraid to join themselves to the disciples. They wouldn't just go casually together with the Christians. They knew there was something different about them. They knew that there was something happened there. They knew that something was going on there that they could not explain and they were afraid of. God was there. The church of the New Testament was supernatural. The church of today is natural. It's based on eloquence, speech, knowledge, techniques, good music, uh, social media, etc. But what can that sort of Christianity produce? You remember the principle in the Bible? that everything produces after its own kind? So if it's an elephant, it has babies, what kind of babies will it be? Elephants, right? Little birds give birth to little birds. And listen, fleshly ministry gives birth to fleshly Christians. Carnal, worldly Christianity in churches gives birth to carnal, worldly Christians. Everything produces after its kind. It's, if you're one thing, you're not going to produce something else. If the church is not spiritual, if the church is not powerful, if the church does not have God's abiding presence, power, and blessing, what sort of people will we produce? Weak, anemic, powerless, unrepentant, hard-hearted, so-called Christians. We need the power of God. 
We don't need the gospel in word only, but in power. In fact, I go as far to say, if, if, it's not, if it's only in word, then it's not the true gospel, because the true gospel does not come in word only, but also in power. Let's pray.